Okay. Um, Richard is traveling. He is going to our chairman. He is going to try to connect with us if he can by phone. He, he might be jumping in later, but um, our chairman's not here today. So I'm just gonna start and open the meeting. Um, do we have any, anybody have any announcements that they wanna share or do we wanna just jump into the presentation? Um, I just wanna talk about, you know, we're doing violent 208 um, uh, plan for each of the watersheds. And we, this, this month are finishing up our existing conditions reports for uh, five of the, of the ponds up there. Um, the existing conditions report, I think we did a great job with it, but it, it's not gonna tell you anything you probably didn't already know. Um, the ponds are dirty, but it does set up um, with the data and stuff for the second phase, which is to look at all of the um, ways that we can reverse the trends and all the technologies. And then the third phase will be to match the, the technologies to the existing conditions. And the fourth will be to get the money and actually clean up the ponds. So we have made a huge deal with it because these reports come out a lot. We do a lot of them. We know the ponds are going to be the question is, what are we going to do about it? And that's what this project really is, is to clean it up. It's not a study of the ponds and stuff, but you do have to do the existing conditions. If uh, you go to our, our webpage, Sherry, where is, is it on our webpage yet? I'll send the link out. Okay. So any any questions? We're, we're doing um, Tisbury Great, uh, Chilmark, Squibnocket, Menemsha, and James. So those will be the five ponds. And at the end of the day, like I said, hopefully we'll have a plan and we can go get some money and, um, and clean these ponds up. That's the goal. Sherry. Okay. And yesterday I went to a um, SNAP overview of all of their projects. And that was, there There were some really amazing talks. So I, when those are out in, um, um, and the, 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 when the recordings are out, I'm sorry, um, when the recordings are out, I will send links for those because um, there was one from Buzzards Bay Coalition and she cuts, um, it's Rachel Jacuba, who I work with pretty closely. And they've done some salt marsh restoration where they've cut runnels um, to drain the salt marshes where it's been ponding. And um, so she, she mentioned that. There were some other things to, uh, a, lo a lot of presentations to, um, on wastewater alternatives and um, salt marsh restoration. So some of them are really good. If, uh, I'll make sure you get a link for all those because like I said, they were really good. And um, I've asked Becky Finn from the tribe to give us a quick update. They had um, on the, the herring and the, uh, the um, conference that they had another week or so, a week or so ago. So Becky, are you with us? I am. Great. Well, thank you. We'll see how long my voice <laughs> works. Um, <clears throat> the week before last, um, we held here at the Tribal Community Center a um, EPA um, 106 and 319 training for Region 1 and Region 2 tribes. What that means is it's basically, um, I don't know, if you all are familiar with 106, the 106 program and the 319 program, but 106 focuses on <clears throat> surface water quality and 319 focuses on non-point source pollution. And region one and region two First Nations consist of basically um, First Nations in the Northeast. Um, New England <clears throat> tribes are comfortable with being called tribes. Region two prefer to be referred to as First Nations. Um, so that's, that's actually something really important to remember. Um, overall, <clears throat> it was a really great week. Um, it was a series of in intensive, both field trainings and in-house workshops. Um, members from the commission were able to join us for some of it. Um, and uh, Sherry, is there anything you'd like me to focus on with that week? Mm, 
no, I wanted to mention, I just wanted you to mention it. Um, and you can talk, uh, can you mention Emma's presentation? That was awesome. <clears throat> yeah, Emma, and Emma's presentations are always awesome. Um, she was, she was talking a bit about um, water quality, health and shellfish and um, also some of the other aquaculture projects that the shellfish group is um, involved with, as well as the nitrogen mitigation studies going on with um, the use of Phragmites. <clears throat> so it was a really wonderful, really informative presentation. Um, so there's that. Um, and then we followed that next week with Climate Week, which was, we had an amazing turnout all over the place. Um, and I'm sure somebody else can, can wax more eloquently about that, but it was a hell of a thing to be involved in the, the, planning, <clears throat> the planning of it for the last year. Um, it was really something and uh, kudos to everybody. Everybody did a fantastic job. Speakers, planners, the whole nine yards, it was wonderful. Um, and then the other thing that we are really focused on here is herring. It's all about the herring right now. Um, the herring continue to run into Herring Creek up in Squibnocket. Um, we've, we don't have total counts yet, um, but we're continuing tagging as many fish as we're able to in order to get an idea of who's coming back from year to year. We already have some return spawners that we had tagged last year, which is wonderful. Um, and as a kind of a, a, a side project to this, we've set up a tag reading station in um, at uh, the Herring Run at the head of the lagoon. So we'll see if any of our, our folks are moving that way too, just in case. Um, so we've had nights where we've had a whole bunch of people join us in the, in the um, creek to catch and tag fish, which has been wonderful. Um, we've had a lot of schooly bass running in um, <clears throat> in the creek to also catch fish, I'm assuming. <laughs> Um, and uh, as <clears throat> with everybody this time of year, it's crazy busy and folks are doing really good work all over the place. Anything else? I think that's good. Anybody have any questions? Oh, there comes Gail, sorry. I do have a chat. Sorry, that was, that was uh, a chat for me, but not not intended for the entire group. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, Ken, I think everyone's heard about your biochar and they're all very excited about it. And I was, when Dan told me, he's like, there's reverse tea bags and, you know, use for nutrient management. Um, so I guess we're ready, take it away, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Come on. There we go. Oops. Guess I was running through my slides here. Okay. Um, well, um, when uh, I came out to Martha's Vineyard last fall um, at the invitation of uh, Maggie Craig, um, I was kind of scratching my head about, well, you know, why. Why would we do biochar out on Martha's Vineyard? It's a hardwood forest, and mostly we're concentrating here in the West on hazardous fuel mitigation um, during forestry activities and also uh, in places where we have climate driven die off and things like that. Um, but I, uh, as I began to uh, dig in and do some uh, research uh, about Martha's Vineyard, I realized that there are a number of, of um, important 
ways that biochar can be used to solve problems out on the island there. And just a little bit about the organization that I work with, we're a community land trust as opposed to a straight land trust. Um, our mission is to conserve and restore historic habitats and native biodiversity while generating high quality goods and ecological services from our Alliance lands. And um, so we want to support research, training, education, and, and recreation. And um, uh, contrary to the way a lot of conservancies are run, uh, we've taken um, over uh, 200,000 board feet of our timber to the mill as we liberate these giant legacy oaks and legacy madrones and other hardwoods out there to try and recreate the historic habitats and therefore provide the resources necessary for, for the historic diversity that was there. So just a little bit about me. Um, um, my bachelor's and master's were from, uh, from the University of Connecticut, not too far from y'all. I grew up um, outside of New Haven, uh, Connecticut. And then I've uh, got a PhD in forest ecology uh, from Oregon State University. And then I taught uh, various flavors of biology, including microbiology, genetics, uh, you know, field botany, forest ecology, and uh, 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 majors level biology classes for 31 years there um, until I retired in uh, 2018. And now I'm concentrating on ecosystem restoration, especially where um, biochar production is concerned. Now I put this up here to, to, th that you'll look and you'll see water quality expert is not on, an, on this list, right? And so what I'm looking at is the intersection between um, the water quality issues that you all are dealing with um, on the island and the um, uh, broader uh, ecological applications of biochar and how those two intersect. So um, so just to kind of start off here, you know, what is biochar? And uh, the International Biochar Initiative says this is the solid material obtained from thermochemical conversion of biomass in an oxygen limited environment. Basically, we heat biomass with as little oxygen as possible so that it bakes into char. And that would traditionally be called charcoal, right? Anywhere else in the world. But when that gets added to the soil, it becomes incredibly biologically active and, and has amazing properties in the soil. I should emphasize it is not a fertilizer. It is a soil amendment. It's a substrate for uh, water storage um, and uh, nutrient storage, right? It, and and it, it is very rich in carbon, but it remains stable in soils for hundreds to thousands of years. So not only does it uh, add to soil productivity when it's in the soil for reasons that I'll, I'll talk about here coming up, but it also sequesters that carbon um, for, you know, for very long periods of time. And so it is a uh, climate change mitigating um, technology. But again, because it's so stable and it lasts for so long, it is not a source of food for, for you know, microbes or, or plants. It is a, uh, an exchange surface that amends the soil and increases the productivity. So, so why make it? As I just mentioned, we tend to, out here in the West, we're very focused on reducing hazardous fuels. You've all heard about the horrible fires that we've been suffering through for the last um, couple of decades here. It retains water and nutrients and thereby increases soil productivity, more productivity, more plant growth, more carbon capture. So, so not only does that carbon stay in the soil, but it improves the growth of plants and captures more carbon in the process in the form of biomass. Decreases smoke and greenhouse gases compared to other means of disposing of that, um, that biomass by open burning, or even you, know, you put it in a landfill and eventually it's gonna produce methane, which is even a more powerful greenhouse gas. So again, the long-term carbon sequestration and it absorbs pollutants from water. So I'm gonna take us through, um, well, first of all, you know, how do we, let's focus in on the vineyard. Um, we want to reduce wildfire risk, even though that's not the focus of today's talk. 
um, it's it's an incredibly important issue, and and I'll show you some maps in a minute um, on on uh, Martha's Vineyard. The change in landscape um, uh, configuration and the species that are on the landscape has changed dramatically since colonization, and uh, and that has uh, greatly ratcheted up wildfire risk. So we want to reduce the smoke and greenhouse gases from landscape maintenance burns. So you get, you know, the next nor'easter comes through, knocks a whole bunch of, you know, limbs out of trees, knocks trees over, people pile them up, uh, wait for the summer people to go away and torch them off, right? Am I, am I right about that? That's kind of the way it goes. So you're just burning a lot of that material and putting it straight into the atmosphere. We also um, can use biochar to increase local food production and thereby decrease the amount, the costs of shipping so much uh, food from the mainland. Separating biomass uh, from the waste stream at your transfer sites will decrease the amount of shipping in the opposite direction to, um, to landfills on the mainland. Long-term carbon sequestration, as I've already mentioned, and addressing your TMDL issues um, that we'll be focusing on toward the end of the talk. So I'm gonna lay this out in four parts. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history, about the science of biochar, I'll talk about how, how do you produce biochar, and then we'll talk about its use in water treatment. So, so these, um, uh, you know, biochar is, and the understanding of how charcoal works in the soil is only a few decades old. Um, these soils were discovered in Amazonia uh, that were called terra preta soils, meaning dark soil, terra preta de indio in, in, uh, in Portuguese. Um, dark soil of the Indians. And what people realized was that around these ancient villages, they would find soils in the same soil series, right? Same mineral content, same parent material, except the carbon would be enormous in these areas where these anthropogenic soils were, that is soils that were created by humans. And these, I know these, these uh, diagrams are a little small, but you can see the, you know, these lines, the farther right these lines are means the more carbon there is in the soil at the various depths in the soil. So you see not much carbon here, a ton here, not much carbon here, a ton here. These soils um, were built 500 to, 200 and, uh, to 2,500 years ago, and they are still highly productive, unlike um, you know, the, the, the soils that we all hear about, you know, being heavily leached soils as soon as you cut a forest and plant it to agriculture, the soil um, goes downhill quickly. The addition of biochar has maintained the productivity of those soils for, for, for millennia, literally. Um, in the Great Plains, 50% of the uh, soils in, in Iowa um, are, uh, you know, the, the soil carbon is, is char from these annual grass fires uh, that the Indians lit. Um, and the surface thatch excludes the oxygen uh, and so the heat, but the heat goes down. And remember, biochar is made by heating biomass in the absence, or in, at least in very low uh, levels of oxygen. And so you wind up with these very dark, very rich soils. <clears throat> in in my neck of the woods, this uh, this pencil sketch was made uh, in 1841. Uh, um, you know, eight or ten miles away from where the U Creek property is right now. And you look in the background, and you see a landscape fire burning in the background. You also see this very open landscape with a sort of orchard of oak trees as the as the pioneers talked about when they came over. If you looked at this piece of ground today, and I, can, I haven't been able to figure out exactly where it is because I would love to then get a landscape shot of it. This is the South Umpqua River and it's heading down toward the Canyonville, toward the, toward the, um, uh, the, the casino that, that the Cow Creek Band of the Umpqua Tribe of Indians um, owns and runs down there. So Looking at this landscape today, this would be largely covered with trees. So it was the constant use of landscape fire that maintained the landscape structure that produced the food and the fiber and the fuel that these folks used. Up in the uplands, um, this is down in the valley, uh, the, the last slide. Up in the uplands, you can see this area was burned off along the ridges where they traveled. And you see somebody burning out their camp, cleaning up their camp in the fall, ready to make the migration back down to the valley where they spent the winter. Seasonally migrational people moving up and burning out their areas where they camped in the summer, 
moving back down to their major you know, permanent villages in the lowlands to get out of the transitional snow zone and, uh, and, and have a little bit of easier time uh, through the winter. So uh, every year up and back into the mountains and they carried the fire stick with them in both directions. And again, there's the, there's the fire burning to, to, uh, to clear out a camp. In Massachusetts, um, uh, this is uh, from uh, Thomas Morton uh, writing in 1632 saying, the salvages <laughs> are accustomed to set fire uh, to the country in all places where they come. Um, because it, it would otherwise be so overgrown with underweeds. Now, the interesting thing about the hardwood forests of New England versus the conifer forests of the West is that you can touch off a conifer forest during the right time of the year, and you can burn that forest down, and you can make a grassland where it was. In New England, with hardwoods that are not very flammable, the fire was kept on the ground underneath the trees, and so so it, it was not used to clear large openings of land. It was used to underburn in the forest to create habitat for, you know, the, the traditional, you know, corn and squash and beans, but also on, uh, on the island. Um, it was also uh, 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 used uh, to maintain the vacciniums, including the uh, cranberries and the huckleberries, which were a major food source um, for, for uh, your, your indigenous folks. And, um, um, and so the charcoal studies looking at lake sediments has shown that even though there was no effect on the overstory, and they can tell that by pollen analysis, what plants were dominating at the time, fire was used on a regular basis, um, according to Thomas Morton, uh, twice a year. In our area, uh, it was probably uh, much more common in the fall uh, than in the spring. And um, when uh, Bartholomew Gosnold showed up to Martha's Vineyard, why did he name it? He may name it Martha after his wife and his daughter, um, but he, or mother-in-law, I think, uh, but he, he named it Vineyard because of all of the grapes scrambling all over the place. And so fox grapes and summer grapes highly flammable, they're very fire tolerant, they re-sprout after the fire, therefore underburning would have helped them, help keep them out of the canopies where they're much more difficult to harvest, right? Keep them on the ground and then uh, had an efficient system of using fire to, to manage the plants that they ate or used for medicine or fiber or fuel. Looking at um, the ownership here of Martha's Vineyard, you see that uh, a little over eight, well, almost 9% is your state forest in the center of the island. And then 13% are conservancy lands. And so when you overlay fire risk, it's almost a perfect match. So um, you may or may not know that, the, um, that the, uh, the land for the state forest was set aside in the early 1900s to try to save the endangered heath hen, heath hen on the island. It was an endemic species, the only place it lived. That was unsuccessful and by the 1930s the heath hen had become extinct. And so the wisdom of the WPA said, okay, well we need to replant that into a functional forest where we're going to grow timber for lumber. Well, um, you know, driving along, looking around, and so, so the upshot there is they brought in species that were not common or possibly not on the island at all, red pine and white pine. Those have spread all over the island. So now you have, in, instead of these hardwood forests of oak, beak, hit, beech, hickory, maple, um, that are very non-flammable in the crowns, you have now uh, forests that are highly susceptible to crown fires, uh, which are um, extremely difficult to fight and very dangerous in terms of, of all the housing that is nestled all around there. So I know our focus today is not on mitigating wildfire risk, but if we can kill two birds with one stone or feed two birds with one hand, as my Buddhist friend says, um, we should think about doing that. So let's have a quick look at biochar science, um, what's going on with this stuff when it gets into the soil, and then we'll talk about the technology and then we'll finish up with, with the um, a discussion of, of wastewater. So when you heat wood uh, that's made of cellulose and lignin, it turns into these sheets of graphene 
it shrinks, but all of the pore structures are still there. So this is, has an incredibly high surface area. And because of the chemical bonding patterns in here, all these double bonds that are snuck in there, it turns out that you know because electrons can't share the same orbitals, they pop up and down below those sheets. And so therefore, um, electrons can flow between those sheets and industry uses graphene as a, as a uh, conductor. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of work um, being done now with uh, nano, uh, uh, nanomaterials where graphene is concerned. Um, but in the soil, it, it has a very large surface area and a very high charge density, which means a lot of nutrients can stick to it. So biochar increases soil pH because those charges are largely negative charges and therefore they will attract positive ions, hydrogen ions being among them. And so if you take hydrogen ions out of solution, you make it more alkaline, you raise the pH. Also, some of the, the ash that's left over from the charring process is high in, in uh, hydroxides and carbonates, which will also pull hydrogens out of solution. So this works pretty well in, um, in your very sandy, well-drained soils on the island uh, because uh, those tend to be acid. And so adding biochar to soils um, will, will raise the pH um, more toward uh, uh, a, a level that, um, that most plants prefer. So it has that high ion uh, exchange, cation exchange capacity. It absorbs into those pores. It absorbs water and maintains that. It promotes soil aggregate and therefore aeration. Uh, and it becomes a substrate for beneficial microbes. It, it greatly increases soil diversity, including uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which are mutualists with plants. They're a, it's a win-win situation for both of them. Uh, and also other bacteria that are considered to be plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, that is uh, bacteria that promote the growth of plants and discourage the um, populations of pathogens in the soil. Uh, and then as we mentioned before, it sequesters carbon, the half-life of, of carbon of biochar in the soil at the temperatures that we make it um, has, you know, has a half-life of over a thousand years. So, so once that char gets into the soil, it, it, is, it, it, it stays there for a long time. High temperature biochar that is greater than 450 degrees Celsius, again, is alkaline, um, as I mentioned, um, and uh, that should be, that should be um, uh, work well with uh, Martha vineyard, Martha's vineyard soils. Low temperature biochar is closer to neutral, but it doesn't have as many of those um, important uh, uh, soil productivity properties that I mentioned before. That alkaline biochar can be neutralized by composting with organics. You can uh, rinse away the water by you know, leaching it outdoors during a rainy season. If the um, inclusion of, of uh, alkaline materials are, are not what you wish. Uh, you can use acidifying fertilizers, um, acidifiers like acetic acid or citric acid or even sulfur will do that. And it can uh, be used to absorb hydrogen sulfide in uh, wastewater, you know, in anaerobic situations as wastewater situations or in situations where you're trying to produce methane as a biogas to use for fuel. This is a pretty complicated um, diagram here, but what I just want to mention is that um, if there are, if, if those hydrogen ions are, are minimized in the soil, that is if the pH uh, is high, there's all these negative charges will also be associated uh, with the biochar from the organic acids that ad adhere to it. And they will grab all kinds of cations, positively charged ions, um, magnesium, potassium, ammonium, uh, that you want, but also um, some of your heavy metals that you would rather not have in your soil solution. Um, as the pH goes down, you have uh, more of these protons, most of the hydrogen ions will stick on to the surface and create hydrogen bonding with your, with your negatively charged ions, things like nitrates and phosphates, right? So, so the pH, adjusting the pH will, will adjust um, which of these, you know, whether you're, whether you're capturing and holding more cations or more anions. But the upshot here is that at, you know, neutral to slightly acid conditions, 
um, biochar is going to be hanging on to both of those kinds of ions. We talk about cation exchange, the positively charged ions, but it can also bind and hold negatively charged ions as well. And that's an issue that um, is associated with your, with your um, uh, stormwater, uh, feel, you know, non-point runoff and, um, and your septic issues and so on. And then here you can see that, you know, toward, toward neutral, a lot of your uh, uh, important nutrients are available uh, at slightly lower uh, uh, pHs, more acidic, uh, more of these are available. So that slightly acidic soil that you have here is actually pretty good in terms of um, providing the nutrients that, um, uh, that plants need. Molybdenum is an interesting one because it's a coenzyme, a, a cofactor necessary for nitrogen fixing organisms to be able to grab nitrogen out of the air and fix it. Now that's not so much of an issue. I mean, because you, your issue is you've got too much ammonium uh, and other, you know, nitrogenous compounds in your water. So that's that. You know, you won't planting a bunch of legumes is not going to help you with that problem. Uh, it might help with other soil fertility problems and other upland areas and farms that um, need the nitrogen uh, in the soil. But as far as as far as your groundwater and surface water issues, um, not not a big deal there. Water retention, as I mentioned before, you see, uh, you know, with and without biochar here, 15% um, better water retention, wheat growth dramatically increased. And the soil particles that form um, when uh, the biochar makes substrate for microbes, which produce various um, uh, polysaccharides, these gummy gluey materials that will hold soil particles together and make small clusters of them which allow more oxygen to, uh, to penetrate the soil, increases the tilt of the soil, uh, um, lowers you know, bulk density, and uh, is better for soil, uh, better for plant growth in those soils. Uh, and also it produces substrate for microbes. These are mycorrhizal fungi here. These are um, plant growth promoting um, uh, rhizobacteria here. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, what happens in these chunks of char is these hyphae from the, the mycorrhizal fungi, these beneficial fungi that attach to the roots of plants and improve their ability to absorb water and minerals. Um, they, are, um, they are prey to small grazers, small uh, um, insects and other invertebrates that live in the soil that will graze these down for food, but they can't get inside of the chunk, little chunks of char. And so it creates refugia for these um, beneficial fungi in the soil. Um, and uh, uncharred organic matter declines in a few years, uh, turns into CO2 as microbes use that carbon as a food source and release it into the atmosphere. Biochar, as I say, is, is highly stable uh, in the soil. Once you, once you bake it, you're gonna lose some of it in the process. But once you create the biochar, it remains stable for centuries to millennia. That sweet spot, that 450 to 550 degrees Celsius um, temperature that our kilns uh, that we that we tune our kilns to run at um, is going to give you the optimum. Look at the difference in surface area, okay, where where materials uh, where nutrients can adsorb um, and. Uh, you know, pH, as I mentioned, does go up. Cation exchange capacity uh, goes up. The carbon recovery goes down. So you're only going to get, we, we tend to get around 40 to 50% of the carbon in our feedstock is ultimately sequestered in biochar. We think we can do better. We think we can get that up to at least 50% um, as we continue to, to tune our technology. So um, as a, uh, a, a summary here, um, in the soil, it increases water holding capacity, aggregate stability, aeration, decreases bulk density, which increases aeration, hangs on to charged particles, including toxins and metals, and increases the diversity of the soil microbiome. Where the plant is concerned, it increases nutrient uptake because that exchange surface right next to the exchange surface of the roots creates an ideal situation for plants to be able to take up potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus. But interestingly, um, because uh, sodium, which is a positively charged ion, 
um, which can be a problem in windblown, you know, in, in your shoreline situations where you wind up with windblown salt water coming into your areas. Biochar can actually decrease um, the effect of sodium on your plants. Um, toxin uptake is down. Oxidative stress is down. I won't. That's a nerdy thing. I won't talk about that. But it's a it's a stress that plants undergo in a in drought situations. And of course, if your water holding capacity is up, you decrease your oxidative stress. You increase photosynthesis. You increase water use efficiency. So, how do we make this stuff? Well. Um, um, I was uh, part of a report that was just released um, maybe six months ago uh, that was authored by 40 um, biochar scientists that looked at large centralized plants, mid-sized mobile units, integrated on-site production, which is where I uh, uh, collaborated with several colleagues who are doing um, the kind of work we're doing, and then how is it used in large-scale agriculture and municipal waste treatment. So in large fixed location plants, the fuel goes to the plant. These are multi-million dollar plants. Uh, this one is a 32.5 megawatt uh, installation where they burn the, char burn the chips and the heat is generated, runs a boiler, the steam drives um, an, an electrical turbine. Um, and so, uh, so these largely are, I mean, it's a great business model because everybody wants to get rid of their fuel. So they bring it to these facilities for free. They'll give them a container to take out in the field and get it. So, so they get all their feedstock for free. On mid-sized systems that you would set up, say at a logging, at a landing or something like that, um, uh, you, you, you can do these um, air curtain burners. Um, they're great for getting rid of waste material, but their efficiency is very low, something like 10%. So the yield of, of, of sequestered carbon from feedstock is quite, is quite low. So our on-site biochar production, I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, flame cap kilns um, that we use in the field and uh, talk about how they work. The way the way the flame cap kiln works is that you put your feedstock in some kind of a container uh, and you light the top. You put your heaviest fuels on the bottom, you light your fuels on the top so that as, as heated air rises, it pushes oxygen away from the surface. That convected air comes in from the side to feed the fire, but it's the radiant heat, the radiated heat that goes down into the bottom of the kiln where there is no or very little oxygen, and that's what creates your biochar in the bottom of the kiln. So thinking about kiln design and considerations, you know, efficiency, materials, fabrication, portability, modularity, scalability, those are all the kinds of things that we think about uh, when we're designing these kilns. Um, various designs from the quick and dirty 55-gallon uh, drum, I call it the daisy chain design that I designed for some folks on Guam. Uh, who were um, who are uh, embarking in a large biochar project, um, but the you know 55 gallon drums are ubiquitous on the island. They're cheap, and so these things work pretty well. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of uh, the demonstration that we did and last October. We made a kiln of this design. Various other smaller kilns. These are more efficient double walled kilns. Kelpie Wilson's design here. This is uh, uh, one of the uh, most popular kilns in our area. This is my newest uh, design. A series of individual panels that can be carried in independently out into the woods. So you can use human power, to get these things out in the woods to create your biochar there. Flame cap kilns are surprisingly efficient um, and the capital cost is very low, but labor costs are higher. Um, and this is a diagram of Kelpie's kiln, the ring of fire kiln, she calls it, where, um, where these uh, air flows um, from the bottom of the outside to the top of the inside to feed that flame cap. Uh, my kiln is a similar design that locks together and uh, can be carried into the woods. It stacks up really nicely on my little flatbed. Here's, the, here's what uh, Maggie and I did in October. Um, Maggie cut these barrels and, um, and then I picked up, I stopped at uh, Home Depot on the way over and picked up some um, steel stud material. We linked these things together and uh, notice that uh, here, you know, if I use a FLIR uh, camera, you can see the heat's going right through the side of these single wall things. Now we did produce a nice amount of char, but the efficiency is as relatively low compared to the, the more um, sophisticated double wall designs. 
So operations, safety, feedstock, loading, firing, feeding, quenching, those are all the steps involved. Here's the tools that we tend to use. We love these little cordless saws. Um, um, they're quiet, efficient, zero emission. Uh, we can charge them in the field uh, while we're uh, you know, running, running one battery and charging another one. Um, and then, um, so how do, you, how do you deal with feedstock from the forest? And again, this is an example from, from the West, but you have the same situation uh, on, on your island as well. Thinning from below, take the smallest stuff, leave the biggest stuff. That, um, those are the least flammable trees and they provide the most habitat. And so that's what we do. Plus we're trying to save our legacy oaks out there. Um, here's a picture of a uh, satellite image from before our thinning project to after our thinning project. We didn't really hammer it. We plan to go in and make a couple more entries to eventually thin this down to more historic conditions. Um, we're working on, a, on a, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife project now up in this area where you can see this private industrial land, which is just a, 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 a plantation that's all the same age. These are highly susceptible to fire, whereas our old growth forest that has a pair of nesting spotted owls in it, we're happy to say, um, is much more resistant to the fire. So we're trying to emulate this structure here rather than this structure. Um, feedstock handling, you wanna be careful when you go in and make your initial uh, cuts. You don't wanna pile a bunch of stuff because it takes a lot of effort to unpile it. And uh, so you wanna avoid tangled piles of slash and instead, go into a stand like this, leave, what, what we've been doing is leaving our dominant trees that are still too dense, but we can, we can mill these trees, but we wanna leave them on the stump until we're ready to mill them because it makes no sense to drop a log on the ground and let the beetles attack them and, you know, and, and, and wind up having your logs deteriorate. So you can see we pulled all the small material out and we still have some of our larger conifers in there, but we've also, you see some of the green in there has actually been girdled um, uh, to create habitat for cavity nesting organisms. So those trees will eventually die. Uh, and especially when they're up into the crowns of these legacy oak trees, uh, we, we leave them so we don't damage the tree on the way down, but we produce habitat in the process. We have a Lucas mill that we use to, uh, to mill these logs. This is uh, Maggie Craig here when she was out visiting us and she wrote an article on what we were doing and published it in the Capitol Press. Uh, when she was uh, doing her journalism internship out here. Capital Press is the agricultural newspaper in Oregon. Um, getting stuff out of the woods, putting slings together, there's a lot of human power, make it as easy as you can for humans. I've been using a capstan winch lately uh, that runs off the uh, battery of my truck. It works great for pulling small stuff out of the woods. Loading the material, you load the big stuff on the bottom, small stuff on the top, you wind up with char and some charred logs, but that's fine because we're not putting this in a bag to sell it. We're putting it back on the forest as an ecosystem resource. And then here we have the loading, firing, and the kiln with a flame cap. Notice how little smoke is coming off of that because there's plenty of oxygen to feed the fire on the surface. Uh, and then once it's full and it's burned down, we, we can uh, pull these panels apart, get in and quench, uh, with water and that uh, stops combustion and just leaves the products of pyrolysis left behind. So once you make char, it is, um, you know, all these exchange surfaces are wide open. So if you add it directly to the soil without charging it first, you're gonna wind up actually pulling nutrients out of your soil for a short period of time. So you can get nitrogen lockup in that material. So you wanna charge the material ahead of time and um, you could compost it, you can you know, use urine manure, commercial fertilizer if you're into that, uh, soil exposure on the forest floor or exposure to eutrophic water. So that gets us into the last part of the talk here that um, how do you use, how can you use biochar to uh, clean up your surface water situation? So um, this is an outfit called Princeton Hydro they're in Trenton, New Jersey, not too far from you. And so far, these are the only folks that I've been able to find that are doing this on a commercial basis. There, I, I heard that there was another outfit in the Midwest or, or Colorado, I guess, called I think Biochar Now that supposedly was doing that, but I couldn't find that. But these are socks full of biochar and it's fresh biochar 
that has a huge adsorptive surface. And so they're using it here to dec decrease the har harmful algal blooms, uh, your cyanobacteria that produce a lot of the um, uh, toxic algal blooms. And so you can see this is, they're floating these out in ponds. Uh, they're using these in streams. They're using these in point source situations where they can block these culver, or you know, cause water to have to flow through these before they go on to the next stage. So that's something we talked about, sort of the reverse tea bag idea. Uh, and that's something that I think um, would have great promise for Martha's Vineyard. You can also inject the material in using injector knives. You can either create a slurry of fine biochar and that knife just opens up the ground, lets the char in and closes up behind it. So this is a form of no-till farming. If you till the ground, you lose, a, you lose a lot of carbon from the soil because oxygen then can get into that and energize the microbes that are metabolizing that soil carbon and, you're, and you lose it to the atmosphere. These knives rip open the ground just long enough to get, to get the fertilizer in, in this case, char, and it's down you know, several inches a foot, however you set these blades. So that's a possibility for doing contour ripping on some of your slopes where, where surface water can drop into those slots and be uh, percolated through the biochar before it enters the groundwater. Bioswales have been around for a long time, but now uh, folks are starting to put biochar in the bottoms of their swales to pull those uh, to, to maintain the nutrients and to pull toxic materials out. Um, this is a project in Sweden uh, where they've engineered uh, storm runoff uh, and road runoff. A lot of you know copper from brake pads and you know and 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 uh, contaminants from the fossil fuels themselves, oils and things like that. And uh, this is under construction, and this is what it looks like when they're when they're done. So, so that's been used in a municipal way to clean up stormwater. Biochar, I mean, this is about the most primitive way you can make biochar. So my proposal would be to take a slope where you have a problem with nutrient rich runoff, create a trench and a berm, say three feet by three feet, then add your biomass and fine fuels on the top, light that, keep feeding it for several hours through the day to create biochar, which you can then cover with a mulch and plant in the berm. As this nutrient water runs down and goes through the biochar, the roots of the plant will match themselves up side by side with the char. And you can see, I've seen this any number of times where roots will go in the direction of biochar. Uh, and then instead of the nutrients running into your water body, they become biomass in the plant and the water that comes out the other side, the groundwater that's percolating through there has now, um, a lot of those nutrients have been pulled up into plant growth. Um, almost toward the end here, I know I got started a little bit late, but I, I, this is about the end. I, I pulled this slide from um, uh, a presentation that Jessica Thomas did for you all back in December, where they were looking at um, permeable reactive membranes to try and clean up the uh, nitrogen or nitrate rich groundwater before it gets into your wetland. Um, but one thing I would, I would note about that is that you, if you look at the nitrogen cycle, they're putting those, they're proposing to put those membranes in anaerobic soils because denitrification will convert uh, the nitrates to, to uh, forms of gases that will go into the atmosphere, including um, N2. But if you're doing if if you're doing this in the presence of oxygen, if you're close to the surface or you're close to an aerated area, that nitrate goes into the soil solution and gets taken up by plants and assimilated into plants, similar to that um, design that I just showed you in the last slide. But in anaerobic conditions, deep in the soil, what happens is the denitrifying bacteria will convert that to um, uh, a nitric oxide, which is not a greenhouse gas, but a lot of it will turn into nitrous oxide, which is three, 300 times more powerful than CO2. So, so um, you know, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, you have an opportunity 
to sequester carbon so it doesn't enter the atmosphere and also to, to try to get that water while it's aerobic so that you increase the amount of supply of nitrates to plants and you decrease the amount of nitrous oxide that's going into the atmosphere that is going to exacerbate the warming pro problem. Now I understand this is not, I'm not in any way, you know, uh, dissing this work, the permeable um, reactive barriers because there are trade-offs everywhere. And if this is the only way that you can clean up your anaerobic groundwater, then, you know, then you need to look at it. But the quicker we can capture that water on the surface uh, and, and keep it aerobic, uh, the, the less we will um, have an impact on greenhouse gases. So um, that's all I have for you today. I realize it was a bit of a fire hose, um, but I'm gonna stop the share now and uh, be gl glad to answer any questions um, that folks have in the remaining minutes that we have. That was amazing, thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? Um, yeah, this is Becky. <clears throat> I did add something to the chat, but I was only able to direct message Ken. Um, I was just really curious about the use of the biochar HABs to, or sorry, biochar SOCs to mitigate harmful algal blooms. Um, how does that work? Uh, because um, when you when you first make the char, oops, no, of course my phone is ringing. Um, when you first make the char, there's a there's a, a very highly reactive charge surface there, but no ions stuck to it. And uh, excuse me a second. Never fails. Um, and so. So j just as I said, you have to, if you're going to use biochar in your garden, you need to charge it first. It, I use um, compost tea uh, to charge mine. <laughs> okay, this is oversharing, but I have a little bucket, you know, that I, I pee in when I'm outside, you know, because that charges it up. So it requires nutrients to stick all over those charge surfaces. Then when you put it in the soil, it becomes, you know, it starts to exchange those ions for other ions in the soil and those become available to plants. When you put it in a eutrophic body of water, all of the, you know, largely the positive cations, uh, particularly ammonium, and, uh, uh, you know, are going to stick. But once it gets coated with those, then it can start to do some hydrogen bonding with things like phosphates and nitrates, um, which, are, which are huge issues where eutrophication of water bodies is concerned. And so that's why I call it a reverse tea bag. When you put a tea bag in your hot water, right? Everything flows out of the tea bag and makes your tea. In this case, you're putting it in your eutrophic water and the, that, that super exchange surface in the char adsorbs the materials. Now, one would have to do some pretty sophisticated calculations to say, okay, what is the, what is the kind of exchange capacity per you know, kilogram of char versus how many, you know, uh, liters of water are out there and, and that sort of thing. But the folks um, at Princeton Hydro are apparently doing this. I just discovered them recently and I don't know much about their organization, but char that's made, you know, on the mainland can be converted into, you know, that, that material, that tubular material that you often see around construction sites to keep silt out of, out of, um, uh, storm drains and things like that, that same material can be filled with, with um, biochar uh, to do that. And if you use non-synthetic material like burlap, that when you, when you pull those out, you can then apply those directly to soils. Or if you peg those to the ground around your margins and leave them there, they'll become substrate for your literal plants that grow, you know, the, your, your, your plants that grow around the margins of your water bodies. So you can either leave them in place as a, once they've done their job, then they become a substrate for, for, uh, for your wetland plants, or you can pull them out, put new ones in and take those wherever you want on the island and, uh, and use that char uh, for agriculture. Okay, so do you charge it before it goes into the bag or? Uh, no, it goes. It gets charged when it goes into the eutrophic okay. body of water because it's pulling the nutrients out. 
Um, so, so in your soil, if you just add it directly to your garden soil, that's bad because mm -hmm. all your nutrients, all your good nutrients in your soil don't become available for your plants, right? But in this case, we want to get nutrients out of that material. So by floating those reverse tea bags out there, um, we can do that. And so there are various other ways. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, using, uh, using like road barrier, road blanket to fold into big tacos. Um, you know, there's a number of ways that uh, we could introduce char to those um, systems and be able to pull it out and replace it. Um, um, or in the case of an organic uh, membrane around them, um, leave them there, um, you know, uh, forever. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, could this be used as an alternative to some of the... Um, permeable reactive membranes? Because I know that's kind of controversial with some folks. I believe that it can. And one of the one of the experiments that that I would love to be able to do someday would be to go would be to just bore um, just auger in holes uh, around septic systems, fill it with char so you have a tube of char. So that allows oxygen down and out. And so, so kind of the, the, the more oxygen you have in the system, in the soil, the more uh, plant roots can survive, the more aerobic microbes can survive that use that nitrogen in the form of nitrate in their metabolism, the more it's available to plant roots. Once, once you wind up in an anaerobic situation, your suite of organisms that can metabolize that nitrogen drops fairly dramatically. You have denitrifiers then um, because they're, they're using the nitrate as a electron acceptor in their, in their electron transport chains. Um, and so they wind up um, denitrifying that. So you lose it from the soil, which is a good thing um, under, you know, under some circumstances. And if that's, in, 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 and again, there's trade-offs. You're gonna produce more you know, a much more powerful greenhouse gas. But um, if you can keep it out of your shellfish beds, you know, okay, maybe that's a good short-term trade-off. But I, I believe that, um, and again, I, you know, I'm a forest ecologist here. Um, and so, I mean, I know a lot about how, how all the bits and pieces are connected and how the players play together. But I'm not a, I'm not an expert on um, on reactive membranes, and um, I would I would defer to those folks. But given that biochar is is essentially a reactive surface, um, it should it should behave in much the same way. Even in anaerobic situations, it's going to do the same thing and metabolize. Uh, it's going to allow those um, denitrifying bacteria to do their job and release that nitrogen as a gas into the atmosphere. So, sometimes it's straight nitrogen gas, not a problem. Sometimes it's nitric oxide, NO, not a problem. Sometimes it's nitrous oxide, big problem. So, so again, it's a, you know, it's a trade-off, but it theoretically, biochar would behave very similarly similarly to uh, reactive membrane, permeably reactive membranes. Yes, sir. Uh, Ken, this, this is fascinating. Um, I, I, my question again is about the reverse tea bags. Um, do you know of any application where they've been used in salt water, directly in salt water? And do no, you the, think, uh, if they are, can, do, you, do you think that's a possibility? The problem there is that salt water is full of ions, right? That are not, I mean, sodium and, and chloride, you know, a lot, mostly sodium, but then a lot of the other, you know, trace minerals and stuff. That sodium is going to blast in there and load up all of the parking spaces. And so, so if in a situation where you have sodium contaminated soil, you know, again, you have a big blow that comes in and blows a bunch of salt water up onto the ground, at that level, biochar is is excellent for mitigating that problem because it will bind those sodium ions. But if you put it out in seawater, it's gonna overwhelm um, your exchange surface and 
So, so unfortunately, no, I've thought about that. You know, I, I, I thought about that. And, uh, um, but it, unfortunately it, it's going to be your, your freshwater systems um, that where this is going to be useful. And to the extent that you can intercept your surface water and possibly some of your groundwater before it leaches into your saltwater bodies. Um, but as far as, you know, putting, you know, putting the socks in salt water, it, the chemistry just, just won't work. Thank you. And welcome um, as a Yukon grad. Oh, all right. <laughs> and, uh, well, I also spent a lot of time in Carvelis oh. in, uh, in uh, working with Elsa Coleman in, uh, at the Portland Planning Department. Uh, I think her husband was a professor there actually when I was there, Ralph Coleman. Uh, but I, my question is, I think I think Rick Carney just got to is a lot. We we our PRB project was we had a lot of problems finding the plume it was not on the surface, and that was one of our sort of goals is doing a lot of work before we put in the PRB because if we put it in right at the right angle, really sort of looking at what we were going to get, we could catch it. And we 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 said a lot of these things are just put in sort of generically at a certain, and, and they might miss it. You're saying though, that uh, you can catch it if it's, if, if it's, if it's above the surface is, I just wanna be understood. Right, and um, so the, the idea where with the, with the, um, the trenches and the berms and, and the ripping uh, in, and injecting um, right. into, you know, pastures, and I know there's, <laughs> I mean, that works great in, you know, in the Midwest and the Willamette Valley and stuff, but you guys got a lot of rocks in your soil. And uh, so it may or may not, uh, I gardened in Connecticut. I grew up in Connecticut. I know it's like, they come up every year. It's like potatoes, you know, you just, you think you got all the potato, all of them out of your garden and they come up. So that may or may not be um, physically feasible there. But the point is, is that if you can catch that water and, and as it's on the surface and, and, convince it to infiltrate through your char before it becomes groundwater. That's the ideal situation. Once it's groundwater, that's a much trickier situation. And because your soils are, you know, composed of glacial tills largely and, and um, are so sandy and so porous and so um, uh, low in organic carbon, um, those plume, you know, those plumes the concentrations of those nutrients will will travel farther because there's just there's just um, there are fewer resources for the microbes that would normally break that. I say normally in our you know right. volcanically derived heavy clay soils here and stuff. It's not you know there's there's so much uh, microbial activity going on that we typically uh, you know at least in non-urban situations we typically you know those those nutrients don't travel very far from their source because the microbes are there to intercept them. And no, I mean, in, you know, the 20, I talked about the 208 at the beginning and people are looking for like a magic bullet. I don't think it's going to be that. I think it's going to be situational mitigation. And if, 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 uh, if what you're saying is a different sort of an additional arrow in our quiver, like there are situations here to put that there, that's fantastic. I don't think, you know, we know that there's going to be places where there's going to be PRBs. We know that IA systems, we know Phragmites, we know oysters, you know, to clean up these ponds, we're going to need all of the, all of the various solutions because there may be situations that will necessitate using those, those technologies. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree that, you know, that there's no single you know, silver bullet here that it's going to take, you know, lots of different approaches and, and the PRBs where, you know, where they work, you know, even if they're producing some, 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 you know, greenhouse gas, you weigh, you know, you weigh all of the, um, uh, you know, all of the potential outcomes and you say, okay, well, in this situation, you know, we need to do this now to solve this problem so that we can get a handle on it and not have to, be dealing with it so much in the future, um, but uh, you know. But again, I think the the approach to you know it, wherever we can attack the problem 
when there's oxygen available. Um, you know, yeah. we're going to have a more robust microbial community doing that, and uh, we will be producing, um, you know, fewer fewer of the greenhouse gases. Again, um, you know, in some of our uh, watersheds for the ponds, uh, the farm runoff is a major, you know, nitrogen right. and I guess phosphorus too, farm runoff is a major uh, contaminant and nutrient going into the ponds. Um, I assume in those cases, a lot of application of biochar on these sites where farming is occurring, both, both you know, plant crops and, and pasture, that would that would hold a lot of it there, would it not? It would. And in pasture situations, if you can rip and inject, um, you know, again, the water, that's those little rips are going to tend to ex, you know, to to capture that water. And as it goes, as it infiltrates, it goes through the biochar first. Those berms um, that I, you know, made the little schematics for. Those would be ideal in an orchard situation uh, where you're following the contours, uh, and uh, and so you plant you know you plant your orchard trees on the berm so that they capture the water coming down. Those roots are going to then uh, uh, grab the ex they're going to exchange the nutrients from the biochar surface and then turn it into trees and fruit. So so um, and and even in a situation where uh, w one of the thoughts that I had was that. You know, if you wind up doing this, you know, close to your pond margins, you can actually wind up planting those berms with some of your, you know, more threatened plants. You can actually try and turn it into a conservation project as well and feed that other bird um, as you're as you're doing the project. So uh, and then you create, you know, you create these little micro sites in the middle of a, you know, what was a, you know, homogeneous um, landscape structure. So you wind up with, you know, just inches away, you can have fairly significant shifts in, in your uh, uh, microhabitats there too. And so, so you, you create, you know, the old axiom in, you know, ecology is that um, diversity begets diversity, you know, structural diversity begets biotic diversity, which begets structural diversity and they're self-reinforcing. Oh, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just I just wanted to chime in. It it's I, I got to cry out. Where's 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 Anna Edie when you need her? We could be all be here another hour. Um, we got to take the permeal reactive barriers and uh, put them underneath the individual septic systems, and then you can provide them with oxygen, or you can starve them for oxygen and let them go anaerobic if that's what your situation needs. Most of uh, on the island we need oxygen. So you just supply it with heavily oxygenated effluent. And uh, um, all we got to do is get the state to go along with it and, and uh, change Title V. So that's your job. But thank you for coming. That was a great presentation. And it really uh, it gave me uh, credence and a good organic chemistry understanding to why I've been putting uh, charcoal and, and ashes in my compost all these years. So thank you there for you coming. <laughs> there you go. And, and you know, you, you bring up a good point with septic systems. There are, there, are, there are many ways to mitigate the issues with septic systems. The problem is it requires reinstalling the systems in a large, in, you know, to a large extent. And so to the extent that one could create mounds on top of, of leach lines that already exist, um, that would really, that would help a situation too. Um, drilling uh, shallow, um, essentially just deep post holes uh, around your leach lines where, where you have a tube of char that could then um, allow you know, more oxygen to, to infiltrate as that groundwater is running through. So, there, so, so the, the real trick, I think, um, in, in getting this to... Uh, in being able to mitigate some of that septic system situation is to is to be able to come up with ways to retrofit rather than completely you know dig up the system and and rebuild it because that's you're exactly right those those uh, PBRs you know 
perfect. You, you know, set them up just, you know, just below your leech lines and bam, you know, you're, you know, you've gone a long way to solving your problem. But in a situation that already exists, um, can people afford to tear up their systems and, uh, and, and rebuild them? So to the extent that we can, that we can, you know, add on uh, a nitrogen, you know, processing uh, scheme to them, I think, you know, that's going to be a whole lot cheaper, you know, uh, augering in a bunch of eight foot holes and, and filling them with char is going to be a lot cheaper than putting in a, a PBR. Noli. Thank you. And Ken, it's so great to hear you present always. Um, at the Island Grown Farm, I think we have, there's some really exciting applications for some of this. We have a big compost operation, we border a wetland, and we have a food forest permaculture orchard that's between, and we're planning to do some bioswales between the compost and the orchard. So to integrate biochar into that would be so fantastic. And I think there's a lot of partnership potential in that tea bag scenario with the ponds um, and farms, because our farms could really utilize the charged biochar. Um, I also wondered, you mentioned something about things that eat the mycorrhizal fungi, and we're having some real challenges with the jumping worms here. I don't know if that's something you got, that you guys are facing, but I just wonder if there'd been any research in biochar and its impact on invasive pests. Uh, you know, the, the um, invasive pests uh, generally, um, this is not a ironclad rule, but they generally thrive when there's um, some, some, some kind of disturbance or pressure on the, on the, the indigenous, the native uh, organisms. And uh, to the extent that biochar encourages the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, it encourages the mycorrhizal fungi, um, you know, there's competition going on, you know, every, every scrap of nutrient is being fought over. And if biochar can tip the balance toward the indigenous species, toward microbial diversity, um, and, um, and, you know, and, and uh, recharge that soil with soil carbon, um, I think that as a general rule, you're going to improve the odds of your natives against your invasives. You know, where jumping worms are concerned, not exactly sure um, how, how all that would work. But again, typically if you have a very well integrated, um, uh, you know, native ecosystem, it's much more difficult for the invasives to break into that. Um, and um, one thing I might mention, um, I, I'm, I, I sort of was proposing making the biochar right in the trenches, um, just from a standpoint of, of cost, uh, um, it, rather than making it somewhere else and putting it in the trenches, although that could be done. What's going to happen is that the heat, that, that heated soil can create a bit of a pan, right, where it's less permeable. In sandy soils, that's not nearly as much of an issue. In heavy clay soils, you know, okay, you get pottery, right? Um, but in, in where the vineyard is concerned, you know, because your soils are so, so porous, that shouldn't be as much of a problem. So this may not be a situation that, you know, that where every, every soil, it's going to work for every soil. But even if there's a bit of a pan there, that water just tends to sit there for a little bit longer, has more chance to interact with the char. Char is going to be aerobic, so so it you know. But that that's the one little caveat I would have with that system. If you're going to make the char in the trench itself, uh, is that you you there's a, there's a potential for creating a pan um, because of the heated uh, clay particles. Thank you. John, you're up. Great. Ken, uh, incredibly heartening presentation. I remember reading about uh, the discovery X years ago uh, in, the, in the Amazon, and it's, it's wonderful how things have progressed since. I also remember wondering what all the fuss was about 10 years ago about it. Now I, I finally understand. 
and it's great that there's potential application to the issues on the island. I wonder either in your own ex direct experience or in, in what you've learned about um, uh, the Princeton Hydro Group, whether you've discovered any cases where um, a plume, in other words, groundwater that's, and in this case, groundwater that is known to be polluted with nutrients uh, and where its entry point, for example, into a freshwater pond is known, where the sort of source point intervention uh, using, as you say, the tea bags has been utilized or, in, or also whether anything has been attempted by following the plume further up its stream if it's not too far underground you know, to, to use your idea of, of a, you know, a column of biochar to intercept it. Yeah, well, you bring up a good point of point source versus non-point source. Point source, uh, and that's what we, where, we, where we saw the, um, the uh, uh, socks of biochar right up against that culvert there, right? Because we know there is a point where you can force all of your water to go through char. And that's an ideal situation. You have a meander coming down into one of these um, bodies of water and you can stack some, some socks in there. Um, that, you know, intercepting that water because that's ultimately in those streams, a lot of that water is ultimately groundwater that, that comes out into the streams and then goes into those other bodies of water that you're trying to mitigate. And, and so that's an ideal situation um, because you know where you know, where your water is and you can mitigate it in a small, you know, area and you can do an intensive mitigation there. The real, the bigger problem is non-point source, either, you know, slopes that are, you know, plumes from, from deep groundwater or surface runoff after a heavy storm. Those are more difficult to mitigate. And that's why kind of these long um, contoured solutions, you know, rip and inject or, or, or create biochar swales um, will help, you know, capture that, that non-point source stuff that, that's, what, that's much trickier to deal with. And, and, and it's really, it's kind, of, it's kind of another, you know, leap forward, this idea of, I mean, once it gets into the water, you, you, game's over, right? Except that now we can actually pull it out of the water body that it's in. And so that's the real, you know, I think exciting part of, of you know, using sort of the reverse teabag analogy is that the game's not over. Um, you can actually pull material out after everything else you've tried to do upstream might have failed. You have another mitigation step that, that you can do. So I, I, I know I didn't answer your question very well. Um, I, I've just recently discovered Princeton Hydro. Um, I haven't had a chance to really plow through their uh, website and see, but they've got projects uh, um, scattered around the East. Um, and, um, and so I, I'm anxious to learn uh, more about, about these folks and what they're doing. But I just used, you know, I mean, I, I have a situation where I live on the North Umpqua River and, um, and we have just enough boat traffic to tear up my bank, you know, with the wakes. And so I, you know, I, in order to get my willows started, I used an old sheet filled it up with um, sand and silt, pegged it down with, uh, um, you know, with, with, uh, with willow stobs and it, so far it's working. So, so it, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a simple concept, but ultimately, you know, the devil's always in the details where implementation is concerned and how expensive are these things? I don't know how available, I, I don't know. So as I say, I've just discovered these folks. Um, I, you know, we sort of brainstormed this out last October and came up with this idea on our own. And lo and behold, there are folks out there doing it. So, and a quiz, a quick, quick follow up. Oh, sorry, May. Go for um, it. No, man, and that's also augurs really well that that there's some convergence uh, towards doing this sort of thing. And I guess what, I mean, I could contact them directly because I, well, what, what would be interesting to know is are they doing experimental work or do they have funds that, that you know, un, in the form of research money where they might be interested in trying things out, for example, in a small kettle pond. Um, and I wonder also, for example, the, the you know, the United States uh, National Park Service, Cape Cod National Seashore, 
has a large number of kettle ponds that they've been doing very good science uh, with monitoring for decades. And um, I'm sure I know they vary in terms of uh, the, their, their, their eutrophic stage or lack thereof. Um, so, I mean, a larger scale, I mean, I wonder, frankly, about federal money to, to do this as, as experimental work. We, uh, we just uh, last year finished a, a 12 acre project out at U Creek. Um, we did a 32 acre oak restoration project where we, um, in, in the West, in the absence of fire, the conifers win. But the oaks are much more important because of all of the mass they produce and they're, they're keystone species in terms of maintaining, you know, diversity of the acorns, things that eat the acorns and things that eat the things that eat the acorns and so on. And so there's interest by the NRC, Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, to, to mitigate that. And so we wound up, um, you know, thinning out around our oaks to save these three, 400 year old legacy trees. Um, but also 12 acres of that, we got funding to convert the slash from that project into biochar. And, uh, and that was a, a very successful uh, project. Um, we're working, we're halfway through a US Fish and Wildlife uh, um, project now to do another five acres. That, actually that polygon that I showed you up against that old growth forest is our, is our um, US Fish and Wildlife project. So there are um, Partners for Fish and Wildlife is the program that uh, Fish and Wildlife has. Uh, the NRCS um, has their um, conservation stewardship program. So, so there, is, um, there is federal funding out there uh, to do this work. Now, it, it tends to vary state by state or region by region. I'm not exactly sure which, um, but, uh, and whether um, you know, biochar production is something that NRCS is funding in Massachusetts, I, I'm really not sure. Um, but, but there are a couple of, you know, federal sources um, of, of funding through U.S. Fish and Wildlife and through uh, the NRCS um, that, we've, that we've used um, to do the restoration work that we're doing at U Creek. Um, and then, you know, so the research part, I know there's another question out there, but, the, but the, another really important aspect of research that I've been trying to get funding for for a while, and I finally kind of given up and I'm just going to start you know, partly self-funding and partly looking for private money is to do enough replicates of, you know, where we weigh the feedstock in and weigh the carbon coming out. And so we know exactly what the carbon capture rate is if you use this type of kiln and this methodology, because then that carbon sequestration has a value. If we can quantify it, it has a value. And so that would help mitigate the cost of creating the biochar in the first place, if you can then trade those credits for um, off, on the offset markets, and there's actually, oddly enough, there are crypto-like carbon tokens that are being traded. Uh, there's an outfit out of Toronto, uh, Canada called Carbon Face um, that's doing that now. And so, so there's a real deficit of, of data on, on the uh, carbon sequestration efficiency of these kilns, and so I know that we're that we're kind of gone a little bit of a field from 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 the you know weight, uh, uh, groundwater mitigation, but but anything that we can do to narrow the gap between the cost of making biochar and implementing biochar um, projects would would be a big step. Uh, so so. Um, uh, carbon back crypto seems kind of like oxymoronic to me, but I'm not an economist. So, um, so I don't know where that's headed, but certainly there are offset markets and certainly um, biochar would be a premium offset because um, right now all carbon, carbon offsets are, um, are being uh, sold from standing forests that can burn down, that can be illegally logged, that can be hollowed out underneath for goat farmers and avocado farmers where once you put char in the ground, it's in the ground. Nobody, that, it's never gonna go away and it lasts longer than forest carbon lasts. So, so all of those, you know, I have a natural resources economist that's champing at the bit to get data, to be able to create the algorithms, to plug these things into those carbon markets. And that's a huge opportunity to help um, lower the, you know, lower the cost of doing the work. And last question, Mr. Doyle. Uh, 
thanks. Um, and I have to leave in a moment, but but thanks, Ken, for making this presentation, you know, so kindred to our, our local conditions here. Um, and I think you, you covered a lot of ground and did a great job of ex kind of explaining the runaway raft of benefits to biochar. Um, so this is more of a comment and maybe somewhat of a clarion call to the to the group. You and I have been speaking a little bit with Maggie Craig about a potential showcase, um, you know, where we could really customize the operation itself um, and uh, for, you know, to, to show to fire departments, get them comfortable with it, show it to land conservation group board members, get them acclimated, you know, with the practice itself. Um, and I think to the, like what, what this presentation explained to me well is to the extent that we can create demand for the char, right? And figure out what the, what the different applications are, um, then we can really, you know, drive the, 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 the actual forest clearing part and the wildfire mitigation, you know, part of it all, um, which has mixed in many benefits in and of it, you know, self as well. So I, I'm glad that Sherry was able to put this together for Water Alliance. Thanks, Sherry. And um, thanks for making time, you know, to join us today and unpack it. Sherry, you have the final word. Okay. I have one question though. Um, for the, um, the name of the company, was it Princeton Hydro? Princeton Hydro, yeah. And, and okay. on one of the slides there, I have their uh, web address. Okay. Yeah, somebody somebody had asked me that. Now it's it's great information. Thank you so much for taking the time and doing this. Um, it gives us another thing to look at. It's awesome. Yeah. So that's so that's what I like about it. Another it's another tool. Thank you. Sherry, will this be with will this recording be available somewhere? Yes, I will send it out to um, Water Alliance. I've had several people already ask me for it, so I I think it will be done. I don't edit it or cut it or so you just kind of have to fast forward through parts you don't want to listen to. But um, yeah, um, I can make it available later today. Great. Thank so you. So you get do you get to hear all of my ums and ahs in there? Yeah, all the ums and ahs. <laughs> Just proud of myself when I can get it up on the website that you know I can't do editing to. <laughs> you're, you're from the Umqua region, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. I never thought about that. Uh, right, well, but, listen, thank you guys. Thank you, okay. you Ken. Hopefully, uh, Richard will be back next month. And um, and thank you again, man. You know, we keep you know pushing and pushing the envelope and 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 looking for innovation and uh. And this is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else before I end it? Thank you, guys. Nope. Our me next meeting will be June 16th. And I'm hoping to have um, Emma give her presentation on um, uh, bioreduction, uh, natural bioreduction. And um, if anybody has anything else they'd like to hear about, let me know. Have a nice day. Right. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Sherry, for getting us in.